we come to our second session where we are considering now uh, the section of the repentance of Israel. And we left off in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 uh, in our last session, looking at how that God was looking for, through the chastisement he brought upon them, the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which would happen for those who are exercised by the chastening. So when we come back to Joel, and we have a look now at the passages, uh, a couple of them from chapter 1, verse 14, we find here what they were being called to. Yes, judgment was coming, but they were being called to a solemn assembly. So in Joel chapter 1 and verse 14, sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of Yahweh your God and cry unto Yahweh. So this is the context of what really we're looking at in our second class. And it's picked up in chapter 2 and the first verse there we read, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Yahweh cometh, for the night is at hand, or it is nigh at hand, sorry. So that's the, the key issue, is that they were to be preparing themselves for what was coming upon them. Now, with this, we, we certainly recognize and we see in the whole situation that's taking place here, that there is to be a um, change of heart that really is what God is looking for. And so we come to chapter 2 and we see in verse 12, Therefore also now saith Yahweh, Turn ye unto me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. So that's what God was looking for, was fasting, weeping, and mourning. And it's the idea of denying ourselves the pleasures of the world. And remember that there would have been that remnant in Israel at this point in time involved in this. So the point that we, we want to make here is and turning is not simply the cessation of sin. So quite often when we think of, you know, what is repentance, sometimes our, our young people will tell us what's the idea of, of stopping from sinning. But it's more than that. It is the idea of changing direction. It's the U-turn that the Bible kind of pictures for us. This idea not just of, of ceasing from sin, although that's part of it, but now it is actively traveling in the other direction. So it's not no movement, it's movement in a godly and in a righteous way. So this is picked up in Titus, the idea in Titus chapter 2 and verse 12, where we're told, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lust, so there's the, the stopping of sin, there's the fasting, um, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is the idea. It's the denying of the ungodly and the worldly lusts, but also then living soberly, righteously and godly in this present world and living with a, with a view of the kingdom that is coming, the joy set before him, as we read of the Lord Jesus Christ in the last class. So this is the idea. If you come over to Isaiah and chapter 55 and verse 6, this idea of seeking Yahweh. Isaiah 55 verse 6, Seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to Yahweh and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So this is what he's calling us to do is to seek and to call upon God. So that's the one side of it, which involves forsaking our thoughts and forsaking our ways. This is the way we pursue righteousness, is by forsaking our thinking and our ways. And we have to we forsake our thinking first, because it's our thinking that leads to actions. Out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts. So we have to put away our thinking and align ourselves with the thinking of God. And this, if we come back to Joel now, is really what is being driven at is a real, um, genuine repentance. So we have it there in Joel chapter 2 and at verse 13. Rend your hearts and not your garments, and turn unto Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. 
So this is the key. It is not an outward show. It's an inward show. So we think of, we read about this in the New Testament, about the unfeigned faith. It's not a show. It's not something we put on a suit and a tie and a, and a Sunday face. This is a full and complete turning to God um, because he's gracious and he is slow to anger. He's merciful and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. And so we're reminded of this throughout the New Testament. We read in Romans 2 this idea that it's not the outward show uh, that's seen of men. So we think in Romans 2 verse 28, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So we, we put this into terms of ourselves as well. It's an inward and, and circumcision of the heart, cutting off the pleasures of this life at the level of our hearts. So it's not just what is seen openly by others. It's not just the, the face or the facade that we put in, but it's the change that has to take place internally for each and every one of us. And of course, this is what Peter picks up in 1st of Peter chapter 3. Now, he's talking about the adorning of the sisters here. Um, but of course, it's a universal principle in, in verse th 4. Let the adorning be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. So we think about this, you know, David's time when Samuel was told, look, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. And so that's what he's interested in us is the hidden man of the heart, which is shown in our character, the meek and the quiet spirit. And this is really what God has been looking for from the very beginning. We think of Psalm 51, David's prayer after his sin with Bathsheba, the sacrifices of God. They're not the outward sacrifices, but it's the broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So it's, it's breaking the spirit of flesh. It's not celebrating the spirit of flesh as mankind does, where, you know, man's achievements and all of the things that he has done are celebrated, but rather it is breaking that the will and the spirit of the flesh, our thoughts and our ways, and having that contrite heart where we are coming back to God. And this is picked up in, in the imagery of Joel. So if we go back to Joel chapter 2, and uh, we, we find here in verse 12, this is what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to affect every level of society. Uh, sorry, Joel 2 verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, them that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of, his, out of her closet. So it's the entire congregation, every level, the elders, the children, right down to the babies. And it would affect everybody. Nothing was more important. It was the bride, uh, bridegroom coming out of his chamber, the bride coming out of her closet, the weddings put on hold because of what is going on here. And brothers and sisters and young people, that has to be our mindset when it comes to the word of God. We can't segregate ourselves. This is everybody's in. Our kids, right down to the littlest, uh, those that have important things going on in their lives, it doesn't matter. All of us need to be paying attention to God in the things that we are doing. So you look at this as it comes down to verse 17. Let the priests and the ministers of Yahweh weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Yahweh. Give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen may rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? So here is, it's, it's top to bottom, but especially the spiritual eldership, the, the ministers of Yahweh, they are to be weeping and, and praying to God for a change to take place, asking God to spare the people and to give not Yahweh's heritage for a reproach. So the, the heathen can, can, can rule over them, which, which they have been doing for many years. Um, so the people would say, well, where's the God of Israel? Um, and, and this really is the picture that we have in Joel. 
is it's this change in what's taking place. So remember, the first part of Joel, verses chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 up to about verse 11, is dealing with those invasions, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, and, and Roman that would eventually see the eclipse of the Jewish heavens that we'll look at in just a moment. Um, but when we come to this part, Israel is calling upon their God. And what we are seeing here in Joel chapter 2 is a change of the fortunes or the blessing upon Israel that's coming. So just look down at verse 20. We find here that God says that he's going to remove far off from you the northern army. So multiple northern armies have come down into Israel. Babylonians, Medo-Persians, Greeks, Romans, and eventually the, the, the Gogian host will come down down. Well, God says, I'm going to remove them, drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the East Sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. So this is going to be Yahweh's slaughter upon the mountains of Israel. And just notice that, that phrase there, the East Sea, and this idea of the stink of the armies that come against Israel being destroyed. Now turn, if you would, just back a few pages to Ezekiel chapter 39. Because Ezekiel chapter 39, part of the march of the rainbowed angel, we have Yahweh's sacrifice. And it comes up in Isaiah as well, um, the, the sacrifice in Bosra, where God says that I'm going to turn you back because you come from the northern parts, right? So he's going to leave but a sixth part, bring them on the mountain of Israel, and there they're going to fall. And he says, I will give you to the ravenous bird of every sort, to the beasts of the field, to be devoured. And so this is the situation that we read as we continue down in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day, I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. So remember that, the stink, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. There's the East Sea. Remember he says, I'll, I'll change his face towards the East Sea. It shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there they shall bury Gog and his multitude and shall call it the Valley of Ham and Gog. Seven months they're going to be burying there. And it's going to go on during all this period where he's going to cleanse the land. So just pick up those phrases there. It's the east of the sea, which is exactly what we just read about in Joel. It's going to stop the noses of the passengers. The stink would come up and there would be men of continual employment, verse 14, passing through the land and burying um, uh, with the passengers those that remain on the face of the earth to cleanse it. And this goes on for a period of seven months. So this is the picture. It's, it's totally tied in with what we read about in, in Joel as to what we read about in Ezekiel. So these are events. They are the same event. Um, and it's like doing that harmony of the prophecies. We talk about this with the harmony of the Gospels, where we take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we align them together. Well, we can do the same thing as a harmony of the prophecies. It makes for a great Bible class series where we take Joel and Zechariah and Ezekiel and Daniel and others, and we line them all up and see that these are uh, concurrent events uh, that are taking place. So while this is going on with the northern invader, what God is really focused on in Joel is what happens to Israel. So in Joel chapter 2 and verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for Yahweh will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. The fig tree, uh, so the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. So remember that we had had the, the land being destroyed and made desolate and stripped bare and the cattle crying out to God in, in chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. Now there's pastures in the wilderness springing up and the trees are bearing fruit and the fig tree and the vine yield their strength to the children of Israel. So there is a natural blessing that comes to the land of Israel once again. And tied into the midst of that, of course, comes this expression in chapter 2 and verse 23, where he talks here about the former rain. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. So there's both a natural 
and a spiritual application to this. We can almost see the natural application has been taking place in the land. It's been recovered, it's come back, but there's going to be more than that in that there will be a spiritual one with this as well. Now we want to take this and put it in context of the feasts. And we have our calendar year, so this is the Gregorian calendar at the center of our chart. Um, but the Jewish year, of course, doesn't follow Pope Gregory's calendar, who changed times and laws. Rather, it follows its own character laid out originally by Yahweh himself. So here we have the, the 12 months, beginning with the month Nisan, um, and following right the way through the year. So it begins in sort of like March, April, and it goes on from there. And we have, of course, um, the picture here of the, the seasons, where we have uh, the growing of the grains, the harvest, the barley, the wheat harvest. And these all tie in then with the feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of first fruits, the Feast of Weeks. And then you have the dry season through the summer. And then we have the, um, the olive harvest, the, the fig and the grape harvest that are going on. And you have your Feast of Trumpets and Atonement and Tabernacles and so on. And, and then planting begins again. So that's the picture that we have of these Jewish feasts. And what's interesting is that the former and the latter rains kind of run over top of these. So we have the latter rains, which basically will take place in that beginning of the year. So just before Passover and first fruits, and the former rains, which begin at the end of the, the last year, so to speak, where we have um, before plowing and planting, we have rain that softens the ground and, and gets everything prepared for this period of time. So the former rains, October, November, um, and then basically the latter rains in March, uh, and basically, or Adar and Nissan, which will basically lead into the, the ripening of the grains, um, the swelling of the grains, and the, the first fruits and Pentecost, and so on. So there's a, a chart, and I'll make this available as well to anybody who wants it. Um, but I want to just pick up words of Brother Thomas that he wrote in Eureka, uh, Volume 1, in the little section called The Apocalypse in Joel. And this is what he has to say. Um, we read here that he predicted that Yahweh will do great things. So he's talking about Joel, uh, at which the children of Zion will be glad. And they shall rejoice in Yahweh, their Elohim or Christ that he would give them the latter reign of the Spirit, as on Pentecost, of the first month, and the former reign on account of righteousness in the seventh month, which is also the first of the civil year. That is, this period there shall be a restoration, and that henceforth Yahweh's people shall never be ashamed. So he, he points out to us that this former and latter reign basically line up with those, those feasts of the, the Jews in Israel, and that's the picture that we have of in Joel. It's going to be this, this pouring out of the Spirit. So if we come back to Joel, we have the natural first, so if we, we follow on in Joel chapter 2 and verse 24, the floor shall be full of wheat, the fat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of Yahweh your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. So we kind of have that that natural side of things there, but it leads to the idea of praising the name of Yahweh, your God. And you will know that I am in the midst of you and that I am Yahweh, your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So we have these two things kind of going side by side, and that's often the way it is. It brings a recognition from Israel that Yahweh is their God. And so into that scene, we have then the spiritual picture that is then uh, brought out for us. So back in Joel chapter 2, and if we keep reading now down to verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. So this is the spiritual application to this former and latter rain. This is the idea. Now come if you would, put a marker in Joel, and come if you would with me to um, Acts, because this of course is talked about in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles received the Holy Spirit. It's actually quoted here by the apostle um, as being this event coming to pass. So Acts chapter 2 and at verse 16. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and pillars of, and vapors of smoke. Sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This is the fulfillment of this. And he talks about there that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So it's the, the Holy Spirit that would come upon the apostles, upon the disciples in that day, both men and women. And they would prophesy young and old. And, and this would be an incredible event that would take place. And it would be before the notable day of the Lord would come, which, of course, in their case, the first application of this would be AD 70, when the sun would be darkened, meaning the Jewish heavens and earth would be darkened. Now, what's interesting is that we have evidence of this. Come over from Acts to first of, or second of Corinthians chapter one, and we find here that this is actually certified for us. I mean, we, we've got the apostle who has spoken about these things, but it's certified by us by the apostle Paul as well, where he says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21, he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So they were anointed, they were sealed with the spirit, but it calls it there the earnest of the spirit. And the word there is the idea of money that is given as a pledge or a down payment, and the full amount would subsequently be paid. So this isn't the, the full paying out of the Spirit. The rest is yet to come. This is the down payment. The idea is also expressed here of the idea of a, um, a wedding ring. But not the wedding ring, but the engagement ring, like all the what is paid ahead of time to give the pledge. So it's a pledge of what is coming. And so what the apostles received in the first century was the pledge of what was going to be coming. The rest would come later on. So that's the, the pouring out of the Spirit um, at the time of the apostles. Now, what I want you to look at here, if you come back to Joel chapter 3, and at verse um, 30, we read here that I will show uh, wonders in the heaven and in the earth. This is quoted by the uh, in the Acts. Uh, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Yahweh come. So here we have the wonders in heaven and earth. And then there's going to be this great and terrible day of Yahweh where we're going to see the sun and the moon turned into darkness. Well, this is talking about the eclipse of the Jewish heavens and the earth. Come over to uh, Second of Peter chapter three. Second of Peter chapter three talks about the same time. It's Paul's letter. Uh, sorry, Peter's letter is basically given at the time period just prior to AD seventy. And so we read here that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that therein shall be burned up. And he says, we're looking for um, a new heavens and a new earth. But I just want you to notice what he says here we, is that seeing that these things are going to be dissolved. What is he talking about? 
Well, he talks about um, verse 5 of, of 2 Peter 3. It says there that they, this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens that were of old and standing out of the water and by the water, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, right? But then he says in verse 7, the heavens and the earth which are now, which is the Jewish age in which he lived, are kept in store, reserved for fire against the day of judgment, perdition of, uh, and, uh, uh, of ungodly men. So we have here the judgment in AD 70, that is when the heavens and the earth would pass away. So he exhorts the brothers and sisters of the day, seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, right? They had to have a, a desire looking to the future, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall be melted with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look past this, we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Now, what's exciting about this is that there are two darkenings of the heavens in Joel. Um, there are two periods when the heavens are going to be darkened. One is the Jewish heavens, which is what we've been reading about right here. The second one is going to be the Gentile heavens going to be darkened, which we'll look at in our fourth class today. Now, Brother Thomas comments on this again back in, in Eureka Volume 1, and this is what he has to say in the section of the Apocalypse in Joel. He says that Joel foretold that between the two spirit reign periods, Zion's sun should be turned to darkness, and the moon of her ecclesiastical heavens into blood, before the great and terrible day of Yahweh should be apocalypse or revealed upon Israel's enemies, whose destruction shall proceed from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, in which shall be deliverance for the remnant upon whom Yahweh shall call. So between those two uh, periods that we have in Joel, we have the eclipse of the Jewish heavens. Now, if you come back to Joel... And, and we look at these, the two markers we want to kind of put into the chapter are, is basically this. The first eclipse of the heavens comes in Joel chapter 2 and verse 30. This is the eclipse of the Jewish heavens, right? So we've got the spirit being poured out. That's picked up by, by Peter in Acts saying this is this day is fulfilled in front of you. And there's going to be an eclipse of the heavens in verse 30. The sun and the moon turn to blood, right? Well, the second eclipse takes place in chapter 3 and at verse 15, just after Armageddon. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of, of decision or threshing. The sun and the moon shall be, shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That second eclipse is the eclipse of the Gentile heavens. So if we go back to our chart that we had put up earlier on, we see here that we have this period where there is the latter rains that Peter refers to. I um, mean, it's interesting that, you know, you've got Passover, um, you've got the first fruits, you've got the, the, the lamb that was slain from the beginning of the world and so on. And then you have the Feast of Pentecost where we had the pouring out of that spirit. And very shortly after that, you have the eclipse of the Jewish heavens. Right, So this is the situation where the body pot politic of Israel was going to be, um, it, it died basically, it was, it was dead, and then there would be this eclipse period. Now let me just take you through a couple of verses that kind of demonstrate, this is the dry season, right? So you've got this pouring out of the Spirit, and then we have this dry season that's going to take place. So if we take a look at James chapter 2 and at verse 26, he makes this comment. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So when you have a body that is devoid of the spirit, doesn't have the power of life in anymore, he says that's like having faith without works. Um, and that's, of course, what Israel became. In fact, it's brought up by the Lord in Matthew 24 and verse 28, where he makes the comment, wherever the carcass is, well, what's a carcass? A carcass is a body without spirit. So Israel as a nation had become a carcass. They'd lost the word of God. It was no longer running through their veins and their minds and their hearts. They had simply become a structure um, that was decaying away. Well, where that carcass is, the eagles would gather together. 
And of course, this is what was prophesied in Deuteronomy 28, in verse 49 and 64. He says there, Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift of the, as the eagle flies, and Yahweh shall scatter thee, verse 64, among all people from one end of the earth even to the other. So the, the body pot politic of Israel that had died, that had lost its spirit life, the Roman eagles would come and they would scatter the bones of the carcass of Israel all over the world. And that's the time and the season now that we kind of are going to look at. We're going to zero in right on this idea, this concept now. We've got the two heavens, the eclipse of the Jewish heavens, and then the eclipse of the Gentile heavens. We've had a spirit pouring out before the eclipse of the Jewish heavens, and we're going to have another one before the eclipse of the Gentile heavens. And we have this period that is going to be that of the reviving that's going to take place. Now, I'd like you to come, if you would, to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6 talks about this. Remember, we've been talking about this former and this latter reign. Well, Isaiah, Hosea 6 gives us that time and season. He says this in chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to Yahweh, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. So we think of the tearing, the spreading apart, the, the, the shedding of, of the, the bones of Israel being scattered all over the world. Um, but he's going to bind them up. So after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall ye know, if you follow on to know Yahweh, his going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. So here, Hosea lines up what he has to say with what Joel has to say about this former and the latter rain. But he gives us the time period of when this is all going to take place. So let's just digest that and look at the chart that we're going to put on the screen now. We have the period of the 7,000 years of God's plan. We know that basically the first 2,000 years, around 2348 or thereabouts, was the time period of the flood. And then Abraham would come around that 2008 BC period. Israel's kingdom um, would commence around 1050. And so that's the third millennium, the end of the third millennium or the third day. And then we would have Israel's natural death, um, which would be around AD 70. Now, this is the first day of their destruction, right? So we think of the parable of the Lord. He would be in the grave for three days. On the third day, he would be revived. Well, that's what happened to him, the son who was called out of Egypt. It's the same thing that happens to the nation now. So we have day one. Israel's natural death and then we have day two and we're told that in day two Israel would be revived in the second day they would be revived at the end of the 6,000 years which of course we know historically 1948 Israel's national revival and the third day he will raise us up. But we're already into the third day. We're at the year 2020 when we expect Israel's spiritual resurrection now, the reviving where he's going to breathe back into them the breath of life and they will stand upon their feet an exceeding great army. So here we have this picture given to us. We're back to our chart now. We have Israel's natural resurrection after the period where they've been dry bones scattered all over the world, that he will raise them up. And that is going to be during this time of resurrection trumpets. Uh, the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised. So if we take a, a, a flip over in our Bibles back to Ezekiel chapter 37 now, we see that these things all line up. Joel, Hosea, and Ezekiel chapter 37 
where we read in chapter 37 that there was the valley of dry bones and they're scattered all over the place, but he prophesies as he was commanded, and behold, a noise and a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and I, he says, behold, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, the skin covered them, but there's no breath in them. And that's really where we are right now. It's the period of Israel's national resurrection. Can these bones live? Well, they're going to be raised. And they have been being assembled back in the land once again. Yes, fully, it's going to happen later on. But this is what God has been doing. He says, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come up out of your graves, bring you into the land of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel 37 verse 12 and he says, when I have opened your graves, verse 13, O my people brought you out of your graves, shall put my spirit in you, you will live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I am Yahweh, uh, I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, saith Yahweh. So this is the idea of him breathing into them the breath of life once again as a, as a national body reconstituted in the land, following what Hosea says, on the second day we will be revived, and then they would, they would live on that third day. They would basically come back to life. Uh, the body is there in the land today. Uh, there are more Jews that have to be brought in, but it is constituted in the land once again as a national body. And we look forward now to that time when it's going to be resurrected. And it's the restoration of fellowship with Almighty God is what we are looking for. Remember in the first chapter, the, the, the meal, the bread and the wine would be taken away. There would be no fellowship with God. But now we're going to see that there will be a restoration of fellowship with God once again. Now, this is where Malachi kicks in. If we come to Malachi in chapter 4 and at verse 4, we're told, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with statutes and judgments. So they are to be reminded of the law of Moses. Well, remember what Paul says about the law of Moses. The law of Moses was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And so it's going to be the breathing back into Israel once again of the law of Moses, of the word of God. And remember, that's what the law was. It was the word of God that's going to revive them. And we are seeing this in the land today. The Jews are leaving behind Talmudic sort of, um, you know, the, the words of the rabbis and getting back to the Bible because they don't need some of those Talmudic prescriptions anymore about sewing the ribbon on blue on the inside of the garment for fear of persecution. Now they can openly have it on the outside of their garments once again. So that's what is taking place in the land. They're going back to the law of Moses. Yes, they've got a long ways to come, but this is the process. It's on the third day that he's going to breathe into them that breath of life, and they're going to be restored of, into fellowship. Now, this is what we read back in Joel chapter 2. Remember what he says? Look, if you repent, in verse 14, who knoweth? If he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto Yahweh your God. So here we see the restoration of fellowship with God. If they repent and they return to Yahweh, God will repent of the evil that he's brought upon them and he will bring to them this meat offering and this drink offering. And really, this is the principle that's universal. It's no different to Israel than it is for us today. This is what we need to do in our lives. You know, rend our hearts, not our garments. Don't put a show on for our brothers and sisters and those around. Really, rend our hearts and get back to our God. And this is what James tells us in the fourth chapter of James, where he says in verse 8, Look, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Well, that's exactly what Joel's all about cleansing of our hands, the things that we do, purifying the hearts, the things that we love, and turn it into mourning and humble ourselves. 
so that we're not enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, but rather we're a people prepared for our God. And if we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. And it's going to be the same thing with Israel all over again. It's the same God that we serve that Israel is going to serve again. And when he turns them back to him and, and they come and they repent and they seek his word, he's going to draw nigh to them. And this is exactly what it says in the law. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 28. Remember what Malachi says? Remember ye the law of Moses? Well, what was the law of Moses to teach them? Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. If you from thence shall seek Yahweh thy God, and he's talking about the nations you've been scattered in, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When thou art in tribulation and all these things come upon thee, even in the latter days, and this is his promise, if you turn to Yahweh thy God and shall be obedient to his voice, for Yahweh thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget his covenant of, of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. So this is the key, brothers and sisters, the seeking of God with all their hearts and with all their minds. And the same thing is true for us today. If we find that we have been chastened by the Father and we seek God, we will find him. If we seek him with all our hearts, rend our hearts and not our garments. Don't put a show on for those around us, but really get to the core and to the pith of what we need to change in our life. Now, you know in your life the things that stand between you and the kingdom. I know the things that stand between me and the kingdom in my life. Now is the time to rend our hearts and get those things out of our lives. And, and so that we cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. And God will not forsake us. He will remember his covenant if we turn. And so this is what Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 29, verse 12. Talking of Israel in their time of their restoration. Then shall you call upon me and you shall call... And you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. That's the picture we have in Joel, as a people praying to their God. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith Yahweh. And I will turn away your captivity and will gather you uh, from all the nations and from the places whither I have driven you, saith Yahweh, will bring you again to this place which I caused you to be carried away captive. And so that's the picture is when Israel does turn to God and prays to them, he will absolutely hear them. This isn't like a, a fuzzy kind of, you know, thing that's going on. This is a definite. God says, I will be found of you. And this is what Joel says. If we come back to our, our prophecy in Joel chapter 2 and verse 32, the exciting thing he says, it shall come to pass that whosoever will call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion shall, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And, and the ESV and the RSV say, will be those who escape. So in Mount Zion and, and in Jerusalem will be those who escape. As Yahweh hath said, and in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. So there are those who will escape the judgments of Almighty God, and they will be those who call upon him in their moment of need. Now we might sit back and think, well, how on earth is that possible with the people of Israel as we see them today? Uh, the Jews who can be, you know, quintessentially people will look at them and there's lots of derogatory comments about them and their stubbornness and, and all this kind of stuff. How can God change this people? Well, look in the mirror and ask yourself this. How can God change me? How is it possible that God can take me? Because you know what you're like and I know what I'm like. And how can he turn me into something usable in his sight? Well, it's the exact same way he's going to take the people of Israel and turn them into something usable in his sight. Just think of the words of Romans chapter 10. Paul argues this, and he actually quotes here from Joel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so here's his question. Well, how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? So in order for Israel to call on God, they've got to believe in him. 
And how are they going to believe in somebody of whom they have not heard? So they're going to have to hear about him. And how are they going to hear about him if there isn't a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So there has to be a commission going out. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. And it goes on to say in that text, and he's, he's, he's quoting from Isaiah, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. But he says they have not all believed or obeyed the gospel for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. But his point here is that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And so Israel has to have faith to be acceptable to him. And they have to have the word of God uh, put into their minds and into their hearts for this to happen. Well, we all know the quote of Brother Thomas um, in Elpis Israel, where he talks about the partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the coming of Christ, which he says is going to be on purely political principles. They're not going to go in belief of the Messiahship of Jesus, but rather they're going to go as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth. And of course, that came true. That's exactly what happened. Non-believing Zionists who were motivated by politics went to the land. But what Joel is describing is a people who rend their hearts and seek God for all their hearts and he will hear them. And we know the principle, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And so what has to happen is a change in the people of Israel. So we read in Jeremiah 3, and this is the quote that Brother Thomas is actually using when he writes Help Us Israel and says as a partial and primary restoration. He says in Jeremiah 3 verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith Yahweh, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, partial and primary restoration, and will bring you to Zion. But note the next verse. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And this is a, a, a pivotal point. If Israel is to call out to God, they have to do it in faith if he, is to call, if he is to hear them. Joel says they will call upon me and I will hear them. It has to be by faith. And so they need teachers who are going to feed them with knowledge and understanding. And this is where Malachi jumps in. In chapter 4, verse 5, along with Jeremiah 3, 14, I will, give you, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And what's his mission? To turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There is a job, brothers and sisters, to be done by the resurrected saints and the pastors according to mine heart who are going to teach the people in the land and the rest of the diaspora and bring them back to God. And this is what we find. In the synagogue in Jerusalem, the Herva synagogue, the main synagogue, when you go in there, as we did just a, a year or so ago, there is at the very front the seat that's there. When I asked our guide, he said, well, that's the seat of Elijah because they are waiting for Elijah to come. And this is the same at Passover. Many will set a seat for Elijah. They'll put out a place for him and they'll even they'll leave the door open for him to come and bring them to Zion. That's what they are looking for. And so this is what is going to happen is that God is going to change the situation for Israel. Joel 2.18, back in Joel then will Yahweh be jealous for his land, will pity his people. Yea, Yahweh will answer and will say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make your approach among the nations. So what God is going to do is incredible in the land. And that's what is picked up in Romans chapter 11. That the times of this ignorance, he says, I would not have you be, uh, not have you be ignorant of, brothers and sisters. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in Romans eleven twenty five, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And we're going to consider that, how he's going to bring this deliverer in our next.
next class. But just as we wrap up our thoughts here together, let's go back to our chart and just look at this and see on, on the left-hand side there, we have the national resurrection of Israel in that third day. And it just happens to line up with the Feast of Trumpets. The trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised. And the Day of Atonement, the redemption of Israel, when the Lord is going to be the Redeemer that's going to come and take away ungodliness from Jacob. And we then get into Israel being restored into fellowship with God, the Feast of Tabernacles in the third day, when God raises them up and gives them those former reigns once again. He will revive them with his spirit. So this is the picture we have in Ezekiel 38. I will make a covenant of peace with them. 37, sorry, verse 26. Uh, so in this principle or this time period of, of the regathering of the body, rebuilding, he says, it shall be an everlasting covenant I make with them. I will place them, multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. And the nation shall know that I, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel when, I, when my sanctuary shall be in midst of them forevermore. And that's the Feast of Tabernacles that we come to at the end of that period, being brought back into fellowship with God once again. And so we have... Hosea's words that it's after the third day he will raise us up and we will live and he will give us the the rain the latter and the former rain upon the earth and as brother Thomas pointed out as we read earlier he would give them the latter rain of the spirit as on Pentecost in the first month on account of righteousness because of righteousness and that's what is in Joel chapter 2 and verse 23 where he says the former rain would come moderately because of righteousness that's what the phrase moderately in the hebrew means because of righteousness the former and the latter rain because israel is going to be changed they are going to be constituted righteous once again by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. As we read about in Isaiah 62, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness. Salvation thereof is the lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. Kings thy glory. Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahweh, a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be termed desolate, but thou shalt be, be termed, be called Hepzibah, and thy land Beulah, for Yahweh delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. And so what a glorious picture that we have, brothers and sisters, that he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Their sons and their daughters will prophesy. Their old men will dream dreams and see visions when he puts his spirit back into them. These powers will be poured out upon Israel and also possessed by the saints who are going to be leading them. And there is nothing that this world can compare. Young people, there are no fictitious superheroes that can hold a candle to this. So forget dreaming your time away with the gods of this world that are no gods. And let's prepare ourselves to be sons and daughters of God imbibed with the power from heaven. So that in that day, the, the, the deposit that was given to the apostles that that little sort of like down payment will be fully paid out and we will join the children of Israel in taking the word of God out from Zion. Zechariah chapter 8, 23, 10 men out shall take hold of all nations, um, shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. And as the disciples went out to preach the word, the Jews will now go out to preach the word to all peoples, having the power of spirit, performing miracles, and, and as, as a witness to the nations that God is with them. And the nations will say, we will go with you, and they will be brought back into fellowship with their God. It's an amazing t time, and we have been invited to be part of that pouring out of the spirit part of the Elijah mission and the pastors according to his heart when the disciples go out once again to prepare the way of the Lord and preach the good news of the kingdom to come. But before that, of course, we have chapter 3. 
which is the invasion of the land. What we've been looking at in chapter 2 kind of fits in around that. It's at that time when the invasion takes place. But the invasion is what, God willing, we will look at in our last class, after our brother Don has talked about the signs of the times that let us know that this is exactly the time period wherein we live.